Welcome to North River Church Online. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. As you know, we are nearing the end of construction and will be moving into our new facility before we know it. We are less than $600,000 away from reaching our goal and walking into our new building debt-free. In light of this goal, we launched the Giving Tree campaign, showing you exactly what we need to reach our goal. We have filled in 54 leaves and have filled in $58,925 on the trunk of the tree, which represents the building construction cost. There are 14 leaves remaining on the tree, and we would love for everyone to participate in this giving campaign. No gift is too small to make an impact. You can find the updated giving tree on our website, gonorthriver.org slash update. Over the course of this crazy year, you've been faithful to give to our regular budget as well as the building fund. If you'd like to give today, you can give online through our website, gonorthriver.org slash give, or by texting NRC and the amount to 73256. If you'd like to give online toward the giving tree, simply add a memo regarding which leaf you are giving towards. Also, feel free to mail a check or bring a check to our office. The church office address is 5517 Fort Hamer Road. Life groups have launched and it's a great time to join a life group. If you're interested in joining one or maybe you have questions about our life groups, please fill out the form on our website, gonorthriver.org slash life groups. We will do our best to offer group options that match your schedule and connect you with an incredible group of believers. Please take a moment to pray about being part of a life group and enjoying the kind of community that can only be found in the body of Christ. This evening, we have the Swell for Students. We're looking forward to a fun evening of games, worship, Bible study, and small groups. Students, join us tonight at the church office from 5 to 7 p.m. Thank you again for joining us online. We invite you to worship with us as we sing and hear from God's word. Let's worship together. Hey, North River Church family and friends, it's Pastor Michael and I am standing in our new sanctuary and I'm excited to be in here. And we've got some exciting news to share with you. We are cautiously optimistic that we will receive our temporary certificate of occupancy next week, which will allow us to have our very first service in this space on October the 4th. Here's what we need your help with. We have absolutely no idea how many of you are planning to join us that first Sunday. So we would love to have one service for all of us to be together, but we may not be able to do that in a safe way. And so we're asking you to let us know if you're planning to come on that first Sunday, October the 4th. Here's how you can help us know whether you're coming or not. You can register online, give us an idea of whether or not you're coming. We're asking you to tell us where your kids are gonna be as well. So you can check your family in, you can let us know how many are gonna be in the sanctuary, how many are gonna be in the kids' areas, in individual classrooms, and that'll help us know how many we need to prepare for so that we can look and make a call of whether we need to do one service or two service on the fourth. We'll let you know that early next week as soon as we get that information in. So help us out by getting that to us by the end of the day on Sunday, September the 27th. We cannot wait to gather once again to worship in our new space and we look forward to seeing you. So let us know if you're coming and we can't wait to see you that Sunday. Sing to the King of Glory. To the King of Glory and lie all praises. To the only giver of life, our maker. The gates are open wide. We worship you. Come see what love has done.
morning, church family. We have the joy once again of diving into God's Word together. And so I want to encourage you to grab your copy of Scripture and join me once again in the book of Acts as we continue on in our series through the book of Acts. And this morning, we're going to focus in on Acts chapter 21, picking up where we left off last week in verse 17. And the message titled this week is, When the Going Gets Tough. I don't know about you, but have you ever wished that you had an easy button for life? I mean, times in your life where things just get really difficult, things are piling on, and you wish you had the easy button where you could just push the button and things would get a whole lot easier. You know, sometimes in the Christian life, we walk through difficult seasons, we walk through trials and struggles, and there's moments when it'd just be really nice to have an easy button where we could just press that button and get out of the difficulty or get out of the struggle. And, and some have made the argument that Christianity is an easy life, that you just don't have to worry about anything. Just trust Jesus, become a believer, and then life will just be easy. And if you've walked with Jesus for any time, you know that that is absolutely not the case. And that brings us to the main idea this morning in the text. And as we walk through Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse 17, this is what we're going to see on display in Paul's life. It's this main idea. Jesus never promised the Christian life would be easy, but he did promise to walk with us on the journey. Jesus never promised. In fact, he told his disciples, don't expect an easy life if you're gonna follow me. It's gonna cost you something. We talked about that last week. But the good news is that Jesus is always with us along the journey, regardless of how difficult it may be. Now, we left Paul last week entering into Jerusalem. Remember, he had been told as he was preparing for that journey to go and to take that gift from the churches in Asia to the church in Jerusalem that he needed to expect difficulty. He needed to expect trial and tribulation and struggle. He very likely was going to be in prison, may end up losing his life making this journey, and yet he knew that that's the direction the Lord was leading him. And so we're going to see exactly what happens. Some of these things that were told to Paul are going to come true even in our text this morning. We're going to see what happens as he enters in to Jerusalem. Let me cut to the chase. It's not easy. It's not easy to think about. It's not easy to hear Paul walk through this difficulty. But the good news is Jesus was with him during this journey. So let's look this morning at Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse 17. I want to read the text for us, and then we'll walk back through it together. This is what Luke records. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took them in, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law, and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. 
For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. And some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. Father, we ask this morning that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see, that you would open our ears, that we would be able to hear. And that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we would be ready to respond to your word and to your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You know, as we look at the text this morning, we see play out in Paul's life exactly what was told to him ahead of time. As he was heading towards Jerusalem, as he was carrying that offering to the church there, he had been forewarned. He had been told that what he was about to walk into was not going to be a pleasant situation. In fact, he would be imprisoned. And we see that come true in the text this morning. But as we walk through it, I want you to notice a couple of things as we look verse by verse through this text. Some things that I think are essential for us to understand about what's going on specifically in the text. And then later on to talk about some specific application to take from this text and apply in our own lives. I want you to notice this first truth that we see in verses 17 through the first part of verse 20, and that is that the work of God was celebrated. The work of God was celebrated. So catch the picture here. Paul is entering into Jerusalem, and he first, the text tells us, goes to meet with the brothers in Jerusalem. He meets with James. He meets with the other elders that are in Jerusalem, and he's there to share with them all that God has done in Asia during his ministry there. And he celebrates what God has done. In fact, Paul is lifting high the name of Jesus. He is celebrating the work that God had done. He's celebrating the thousands and thousands of people that have come to faith in Jesus Christ. He's celebrating the open doors of opportunity so that entire cities have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ for the very first time. And yes, he's walked through difficulty and he's walked through struggle as he was sharing the gospel, but he saw incredible fruit. And in this moment, as he is gathering with these believers, with these leaders of the church in Jerusalem, he details for them, walks them through exactly what God has done throughout his ministry in Asia. And he celebrates what God has done. In fact, it says in verse 20, when they heard it, that they too glorified God. So in this moment, it is a moment of celebration. It is a moment of Paul coming home to Jerusalem where he had been sent out before with the message of the gospel to go and to share it with the Gentiles. And he had done that faithfully. He had accomplished what God had set out for him. And he is reporting back to this church in Jerusalem, to these pastors and these elders from the home city there where Jesus Christ had given the mission to make disciples of all nations. He's telling them God's plan is at work. God is doing exactly what he said he would do to save people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And here's what that has looked like in my ministry in Asia. So not only is the work of God celebrated, I also want you to notice in verse 20, the last part there through verse 26, that the unity of the church was elevated. 
You see, Paul comes onto the scene, and we already know that there's going to be some difficulty. There's going to be some issues as he heads back into Jerusalem, that there's this conflict that's going on even among Jewish Christians with the Gentile Christians. There's conflict between them. There's a disagreement of how the law needs to be looked at. There's a disagreement around how customs are to be practiced. Are they just to completely forsake those things that were prescribed in the Old Testament that were simply customary laws? They weren't tied to salvation at all. Or should the Gentiles practice those things? Remember, that was a conflict that was happening early on in the book of Acts, and it's still going on. There's still issues surrounding this. And these elders in Jerusalem, these pastors, these who are in charge, of the church there. Look at the situation. They already know that Paul coming onto the scene is going to create issues. It's going to cause these disagreements to rise to the surface once again and to threaten the unity of the believers in that city. You see, what's going on here is not salvation matters. It's not a disagreement over how someone is to be saved. It's a question of whether or not people should voluntarily practice some of the Old Testament customs, not because it's a salvation issue, but because it's a heritage issue or a tradition issue. And so for the Jewish Christians, those who had seen and recognized that Jesus is the Messiah, they wanted to continue those practices. But they also thought that the Gentiles should as well. And this conflict had been already discussed in the church, and they had already said to these Gentile believers, this is not a salvation issue, but we want to encourage you not to put a stumbling block in front of your Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ or Jews who may would come to Christ except for the fact that they see you doing things like this, things like eating food that's been sacrificed to idols or eating food that was in its blood or things like that. They may not come to Christ because that is a stumbling block. So once again, as Paul comes into the city of Jerusalem, they are walking through this situation once again. And so they come up with a plan. They say, Paul, we want you to take these actions, not because it's a salvation matter, but because voluntarily you are communicating to your Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ, that you are not doing what many are claiming that you're doing. You're not telling them to forsake all the Old Testament customs and that it's wrong to practice any of those things voluntarily, but that you yourself are willing to even voluntarily walk through some of these customs. And so that's what we see Paul do here. We see that there are four men who have taken a Nazarite vow. They've shaved their heads, and they are saying to Paul, you support them in this, and you walk with them in this, and you go to the temple with them. And so that's exactly what Paul does in verses 20 through verse 26. He walks with them in this vow, in this situation, so as not to create an issue with his Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. And you would think that this would take care of everything, but unfortunately, it doesn't. Even though the unity of the church was of paramount importance in the lives of these early believers and these early leaders in Jerusalem, even though they encouraged Paul to take these steps, hopefully to to break down this issue that had arisen, unfortunately, what we see in the third truth is the attack of the enemy was coordinated. So beginning in verse 27, walking through verse 36, we see on display an attack against Paul. And the accusation came from Jews who were from Asia. Remember, they had stirred up conflict already in Paul's life, and here they are once again. They have traveled down to Jerusalem. They have followed Paul as he is heading down, and their motive, their desire I think aided by the evil one is to do everything they can to discredit Paul and ultimately to kill him. And so they look and they lob this accusation against Paul. 
It's an interesting scenario, an interesting situation as Paul goes into the temple courts, as he is journeying with these four to do what they were doing in their Nazarite vow, that there was a wall that was built up and no one who was a Gentile was able to cross beyond that barrier and go into the temple courts. And so the accusation that's lodged against Paul is that Paul has broken this law. It was a law punishable by death. So Paul, they allege, has taken a Gentile who was not permitted to cross that barrier. They have taken him into that. And so therefore, Paul should die. And so a great uproar is caused by this accusation. People are running around. They end up shutting the temple gates because they're worried that they very well may kill Paul on sight. And it catches the attention of the Roman government at that point. They are close by and they intervene and they grab Paul and they put him in chains. And we're going to see next week as we continue walking through the book of Acts that this is an opportunity for Paul to once again share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So take a few moments to reflect on the text this morning as we see the work of God celebrated, as we see in the text the unity of the church elevated, and then as we see the attack of the enemy coordinated. We'll worship together and then we'll gather back around for some time of application.
So let's gather back around the text and think about some application from this event in Paul's life once again that we can take and apply in our own lives. So as we think about what is going on in the text, I can't help but be challenged by the first aspect that we saw in this text. And that is the fact that they celebrated the work of God. Now, there were all kinds of issues surrounding this conversation in Jerusalem. There was problems already boiling up. There were issues that were already being dealt with. There was conflict already on the table. And even in the midst of all the chaos and all the craziness of Paul coming back on the scene in Jerusalem, the leaders within the church in Jerusalem and Paul himself and those who had come with him paused and celebrated what God had done. And I just want to challenge you, and I want to challenge myself with this truth. We need to celebrate the work of God more. We need to celebrate what God is doing. You know, I think for us as believers individually, for us as a church, you know, it's always easy to focus on the things that are not going well. It's always easy to focus on the difficulties in our own life. It's easy to focus on the difficulties we may be experiencing as a church right now, you know, not being able to meet in person and some of those things that we've walked through over the last season. But I really believe we need to pause and to continue to celebrate all that God has done to continue to celebrate the work of God in our own lives to pause for just a minute and remind ourselves of what God has done for us in His Son, Jesus Christ. Maybe that's where we need to start. We need to start just by pausing and thanking God that He saved us. That when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, Jesus Christ made it possible for us to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. We need to pause and we need to celebrate that. We need to thank God for what He's done in our lives. And we need to pause and we need to celebrate the points in time in our lives when we've seen God work in incredible ways. You know, as I look back in my life, I see those flags, those times in my life where God has worked. Ways in which in the moment I had no idea what God was doing. Times when was walking through difficulty and not sure how God was going to weave that into his plan, into his story, and for ultimately my good and his glory. And yet, we can look back now and celebrate what God has done. And maybe for you, that's what you need to do. Maybe you're down in the dumps right now. Maybe you're really struggling Maybe spiritually speaking, you are walking through a difficult season right now. And I want to challenge you to take some time today or in the next week ahead and just write down times when God was at work in your life. Times where now you can look back and just celebrate God's goodness and God's faithfulness celebrate the fact that you were not alone in those difficult journeys, that no, it may not have been easy, but Jesus was walking with you along the way. And maybe today what you need to do is take that very first step and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior so that today would be the day that years from now you could look back on and celebrate that Jesus Christ took you from being dead in your trespasses and sins and making you alive in Him. Church, we need as a church family to celebrate more what God has done. It's easy just to look at the negative. It's easy to look at the difficulty. It's easy to look at the struggle. And yet we have incredible reason to celebrate. We have incredible reason to celebrate what God has done in his goodness and faithfulness over the last 10 years of ministry at North River Church. You know, we're coming up on a decade of being in existence as a church family. And just think about all that God has done. Some of you have been here from the very beginning and you've been able to witness what God has done over the last 10 years. Some of you have come on to the scene like myself five years ago and you're able to see what God has done over the last 
five years. Some of you are brand new. And I want you to know that you are inheriting a heritage of God's faithfulness and God's goodness at North River Church as you join the family here. There is reason to celebrate. And we ought to take more opportunity to do just that. We see that happening in the text, and that needs to happen in our lives. It needs to happen in our church family's life as well. We need to celebrate what God has done. Not only that, we also need to work diligently to maintain unity in the church. Now, as we look at what's going on here, there's some interesting things at play. There's some request that the leaders in Jerusalem make of Paul, and Paul willingly takes the step of submitting to those requests voluntarily, not because it's a salvation issue, but because it is a unity issue. I want you to hear this. Paul's heartbeat was never to create division within the church. His desire ultimately, he even says this, is to be all things to all people so that he can reach all people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whether he's with the Gentiles in Asia or whether he's with the Jews in Jerusalem, he's willing to do whatever it takes short of sin to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we think about that, I want to ask you that same question. Are you willing to work diligently to maintain unity within the church? Now let's think about that collectively as God's church universally right now. Globally speaking, there is an incredible amount of disunity in the global church. Let's just put it in our own country, for instance. There's disagreement over political issues. There's disagreement over the pandemic issues that are going on, of whether to mask or not to mask. There are all kinds of issues that I have seen are creating division within God's church. And I want you to hear my heart in this. There is nothing greater than we can do as believers than to lift up the unity of the church. If us disagreeing creates disunity within the church and it's not over an issue that is fundamental to our existence as believers, then we should be willing to set our preferences aside. We should be willing to set our opinions aside and we should hold up the unity of the church. We should do everything possible to work together as believers, even though we may disagree, to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. And that means the same thing holds true for us as a church family. Listen, I know we have people in our church who differ politically. I know we have people who differ in how things should be handled in the pandemic. I know that. I see it on Facebook every single day. And I just want you to know it is absolutely exhausting. As your pastor, hear my heart in this. I want nothing more for our church family to be unified, not politically, to be unified, not in response to the pandemic. I want us to be unified in making the mission of telling people about Jesus Christ at the forefront of everything we do. Just imagine if Paul would have responded in this situation and said, no, I have rights. And my rights trump me being willing to do something voluntarily to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Imagine if he had responded like that as he ministered in the various contexts in which he ministered to you. And unfortunately, that's been the response in this situation of believers within their local churches. I'm not willing to set my preferences aside for the greater good. I'm not willing to set my opinions aside so that we can reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have rights. I want you to hear my heart. There is nothing greater than we can do in this time of incredible division politically, an incredible division over what's going on in this pandemic response. 
There is nothing greater that we can do as believers than to look one another in the eye and to say, there are things more important than politics. There are things more important than whether we're to wear masks or not wear masks. What's more important is the mission that God has called us to accomplish, and that is to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm willing to set aside those political opinions, and I want you to know I have them as well. And I have opinions about how things should be handled on a pandemic response level. But you know what's more important to me? That people hear who Jesus Christ is. You know what's more important to me as your pastor? That we have a group of people at North River Church whose heartbeat is not a political party, but whose heartbeat is Jesus Christ. And we're willing to set aside the conflict that results because of being dogmatic on those issues, and we're willing to reach people for Jesus. And so I want to challenge you. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you have allowed those things to trump your witness as a believer. Maybe you've allowed those things to trump your willingness to work for unity within the body of Christ. I want you to ask yourself the question, is it worth it? Or is reaching people for Jesus more important than those things? I submit to you, that's what Paul came to the conclusion of. That he willingly laid aside his rights and voluntarily did something that he didn't have to do. Simply to reach people for Jesus. To maintain the unity of the church in Jerusalem. And my prayer is that we would have that same mentality, that same response so that people in this community would continue to be reached through the ministry of North River Church. I want you to notice lastly, and think about this, that even through all of the celebration, even through Paul's willingness to work to maintain the unity, he was still attacked by the enemy. Satan still did everything he could to knock Paul off course from fulfilling the mission that God had given him. And the reality for us is we as believers and we as a church need to prepare ourselves for the enemy's attack. And I think we are witnessing that in our country right now. I think we're witnessing that in our churches right now. The enemy doing everything he can to sow discord, to get people to turn on one another, to get people to focus more on politics than they do sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think he is having a field day right now in the church and in this country. And the truth is for us as believers, we've got to be prepared for that. We've got to see through that. We have to recognize that the mission trumps all of those things. And we've got to prepare our hearts, got to prepare our minds for the attacks that come. So for you individually, you need to be prepared daily for the spiritual attack as you seek to live on mission for Jesus. And church family, we've got to be prepared. As we get ready to enter this new building, as we get ready to do ministry from this new home base, that Satan is going to continue to attack the ministry of North River Church whether that's through discord over disagreements, whether that's through leadership, whether that's through just simple preferences of color of carpet or how loud the music is or whatever those items may be, Satan is going to do everything he can to attack our church family. Would you gear up for that attack? Would you prepare your hearts for that, knowing that God has called us to a mission here And that mission trumps everything. And we're on the same team. And we're fighting against the same enemy. And it's not a political enemy. It's not a pandemic response enemy. It's not a preference enemy. We're fighting against an enemy who's doing everything he can to kill and steal and destroy. And we should not allow him to wreak havoc in our church family or in our lives. We have to be prepared for the battle that is raging now and that will continue to rage on. Here's the good news. Jesus' promise to us is not that the Christian life would be easy, but that he would walk with us in the journey. 
And so even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of struggle, even in the midst of problems, Jesus Christ is with us. He is walking the journey beside us. And that should give us hope, that should give us peace, that should give us comfort, and that should energize us to do what He's called us to do. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your Word. May You take it, search our hearts, apply the truth, convict us of sin, challenge us where we need to be corrected, and set us on the course for what You've called us to do. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to take this opportunity to sing and to respond as we think about this application from the text. Allow the Lord to search your heart. Allow Him to do through His Holy Spirit what only He can do. You sing with us.
worshiping with us this morning, we encourage you to stay connected through our social media channels throughout the week. Be safe and well, and have a great week.